Massachusetts, Mark from the United States. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Mark from the States, how are we doing today? I'm doing fantastic. I hope you are as well. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, requested video today. Uh, it should be pretty interesting. Uh, considering what we were trying to pronounce the word of Arundale or Arundale or Arundale, Arundel, Arundel, Arundel. It's so hard. Um, just in the last video, I was trying to pronounce it. I couldn't do it. Off screen, off camera. I think I get it. But then when I get on screen, I can't do it. Anyway, this is the great vowel shift. It's from the history guy. Love. You guys know I love his channel. So whenever someone requests uh, something from him, I always enjoy watching it. And I thought this would be pretty informative. I don't know how much of it is... Uh, uh, or even what it's about, I, should, I guess I should say. I don't, I don't know what, where this video is going to take us, but uh, I'm assuming on how we pronounce words differently. Um, so uh, should be fun. Should be fun. So come sit with me on this big fake couch. But before you do, go to the History Guys channel. Support, subscribe, watch, like, do whatever, you guys. Uh, it's important that you guys go over there and uh, support his channel. It's a great channel. And I know a lot of you uh, enjoy it. I get a lot of requests from it. So I know there's uh, uh, a certain amount of you uh, out there that do enjoy his videos, as do I. And there's, you know, I just have this. It always think, makes me think of my father. I say that all the time. I'm sorry, but it does. <laughs> um. And if you want to know why it makes me think of my father, you'll just have to go watch some of the earlier ones that I've done in this video. I go into detail why. Um, but uh, let's get into this. This should be fun. I hope everybody's doing good. Uh, this is the history guy, the great vowel shift. Catch up. And of course, today, catch up is mostly made. Well, we're going to go with that. Recently, we did an episode on catch up. And of course, today, catch up is mostly made from tomatoes. And that led a viewer to send me a question about the English pronunciation of the word tomato and asked me, well, which one is correct? And that is a popular question because of a song written by George and Ira Gershwin for the 1937 Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movie, Shall We Dance? With the lyrics, you say tomato and I say tomato, you say potato and I say potato. Let's call the whole thing off. And the, the song says a lot of things about class and culture, but the real point of the song is that the difference is unimportant. I mean, after all, tomatoes and tomatoes are the same thing. Yeah. But how tomato and tomato came to be pronounced differently is an interesting historical question because history, surprisingly, affects language. And in the history of language, a change that would have changed the pronunciation of the word tomato and virtually the whole of the English language stands out as a shining example of the intimate connection between historical events and the words that describe them. The period of the rapid transformation of the pronunciation of English that was called the Great Vowel Shift deserves to be remembered. Hmm. The Great Vowel Shift, or GVS, refers to a period of radical change in how the English language is spoken. The shift roughly occurred in England between the mid-14th century and the 18th century, although some argue that it may have started earlier and ended later. The term itself was coined by Otto Jespersen, a Danish linguist and anglicist, whose focus at the time was on the history of language. Jespersen described the GVS in his 1909 work, A Modern English Grammar on Historical Principles. So am I, am I, let's go back, just, I'm so sorry, I just want to hear and forgive the heater. Um, I want to go back and hear when they think this has started. That described them. The period of the rapid transformation of the pronunciation of English that was called the Great Vowel Shift deserves to be remembered. The Great Vowel Shift, or GVS, refers to a period of radical change in how the English language is spoken. The shift roughly occurred in England between the mid-14th century and the 18th century, although some argue that it may have started earlier and did later. I'm just, you know, I'm only thinking, uh, I guess, of how Americans say things and how the Brits say things. But I, yeah, of course, it's going to start way back. Oh, wow. Okay. 
interesting. The term itself was coined by Otto Jespersen, a Danish linguist and anglicist, whose focus at the time was on the history of language. Jespersen described the GVS in his 1909 work, A Modern English Grammar on Historical Principles. The GVS represents the transition from Middle English to Modern English, and it mostly affected the so-called long vowels, although it affected some consonants as well. And the description of exactly how it occurred is still a matter of scholarly dispute. It didn't occur evenly over either geography or time. That is to say, it affected Scotland and Northern England and Southern England differently and at different times, and it occurred in fits and starts over a period of centuries. But while other languages have undergone vowel shifts, the significant transformation transformation and how English was pronounced over just a few centuries was, well, exceptional. As to the actual pronunciation differences, I'll largely leave that up to linguists to describe, but the shift significantly affected how words with long vowels were pronounced. The word bite, for example, with a long I would have, in the Middle English of Southern England, been pronounced like the word beat, whereas beat would have been pronounced more like the word bade, which would have pronounced something like bought. And all that means that Geoffrey Chaucer and William Shakespeare would have had difficulty having a conversation with each other. While we modern English speakers can read Chaucer's Middle English, and are usually forced to sometime in high school, Chaucer's pronunciation would have been almost completely unintelligible to the modern ear. The English of William Shakespeare after the Great Vowel Shift, on the other hand, would be accented, but quite understandable. That, of course, leaves the interesting question of how we would know how these words were pronounced differently, since there's no sound recording from the time. And that question is part of the reason that there's still disagreement over exactly how the GVS occurred, but it can be divined from clues, such as what words poets rhymed or playwrights used as puns. Chaucer rhymed words that Shakespeare did not. Chaucer, for example, rhymed the word daff, meaning you can't hear, with the word life, which was then spelled L-Y-F. Today, the words life and deaf don't rhyme, but in Chaucer's time they did. They were pronounced deef and leaf. Another example is how people spelled words in personal correspondence. Elizabeth I spelled deep, D-I-P-E, and need, N-I-D. This indicates that by her time, words spelled with E-E -E had already shifted pr pronunciation from the E eh sound of Middle English to the long E sound we use in Modern English, from dep and ned to deep and need. So her use of the spelling of Middle English, where I was pronounced E, indicates the pronunciation of early Modern English after the Great Vowel Shift. Two, there were scholars at the time noting some of the changes, and some even proposed new systems of spelling to represent the changes, and those can help us understand how the changes occurred. But while the question of how the shift occurred is interesting, the question of why is even more perplexing, and there's even less agreement among scholars about that. But yeah, I'm definitely confused. <laughs> I mean, I'm following along. Um, hopefully, now he's getting into something that probably that might explain why they did all this, right? It's why they did it. But it's, the language, just the whole thought of language and how it evolves is, I'm not going to say it's fascinating because it, to me, it's, I just learned to talk a certain way. <laughs> so I hadn't really put a ton of thought into uh, why I talk this way. But <laughs> with him explaining all the, just in the language that I speak, all the differences of, you know, back in the day, it's like I got those wonderful newspapers from Carol and, you know, trying to read those things is, uh, and they're from the 1800s, so it's not, it's not terrible. It's, but it does have some wonky, uh, spelling and, and just, there's no, it seems to me there's no real like cadence, whereas now there's a cadence to the way we speak. Words just kind of fit together better than trying, you know, especially when reading them. Now, that's probably just because I've been trained to read what I know now, but uh, hopefully you guys kind of understand what I'm talking about here, <laughs> because I am not a scholar at all in any of this, obviously. So, you know, it's all just hooey, what I'm, t what I'm saying here, but it's just, is how my brain is. <laughs> 
so far has been trying to process what what the history guy here has been been uh, been talking about. It's 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 pretty wild. Somehow history changed language. What happened in England in the approximately 160 years between Geoffrey Chaucer's death and William Shakespeare's birth that made it so that two acknowledged masters of the English language could not have understood each other speaking their own version of English? How did history transform language? It's a, it's a difficult question to answer. There's little agreement because scholars can't even agree over when the great vowel shift began. One of the most significant factors that's been suggested so to explain the rapid shift in language was population migration. Pronunciation varied in medieval England, where the typical person never wandered farther afield than a dozen miles from their home. Areas developed dialects, essentially regional languages. But events in the 14th century drove greater migration, and especially congregation in the cities, which then brought together people who had different accents and dialects, and the mixing of those changed the language. Part of the reason goes back to Norman rule. After William the Conqueror's victory in 1066, the rulers of England primarily spoke French, albeit the more country bumpkin Norman French as opposed to Parisian French. Okay. For the following 300 years, the language of the court and government was French, while written language was mainly done in Latin. But some 95% of the population still spoke English. As the Norman <laughs> rulers viewed English as a low and vulgar tongue, it went unregulated and was mainly a spoken language rather than a written language. Combined with low population mobility, that led to the development of regional dialects, or at least a further diversion from dialects of Old English. Some okay. linguists estimate that a common person in England in the 12th century would not be able to understand the English language spoken just 50 miles away. But in the 14th century, people moved. Some of you, <laughs> that reminds me of some comments some of you have made about Liverpool and, and uh, um, is it Manchester? Um, or and not even just those two places, but in some uh, some of you have made that comment even today that uh, you it's you so hard to understand someone who lives thirty miles away or whatever you know even today it's so wild now yeah there's you go down to the deep south here in the states I'm now referencing uh, over here. In my experience, yeah, you go down to the deep south, it is, uh, and you get someone who's lived there their whole life, who doesn't deal with people. Now, you, you're always going to find in where there's tourists and and a lot of commerce and all that stuff. Uh, the yes, it's their southern drawl uh, isn't heavy at all. And uh, you can still hear it, but, you know, easy. But you get to, and you talk to locals who've, who don't deal with people from other parts of the country, and they talk, it's so heavy, right? And it's, it, and they talk in their own little kind of code words. And so, yeah, it would be tough to understand them. So I get it. I get it. But it's, that's, a, that's on the other side of the country. And same with the upper uh, northeast and the midwest they they do have those dialects and uh but it's it's crazy to think even now people uh wouldn't be able to understand each other the likely cause was the black plague the first known case of the illness in back. english language spoken just 50 miles away but in the 14th century people moved the likely cause okay. was the Black Plague. The first known case of the illness in England was a sailor from Gascony in June of 1348. By December, the outbreak was estimated to have killed between 40 and 60 percent of the population. The impacts of this mass depopulation were profound, changing economics and culture, but yeah. could it change language? The initial reaction to the depopulation of the plague was for people to flee locations with high mortality rates, like London. But an interesting study published last year looking at data from medieval cities found a surprising result. Despite the devastation of the plague and periodic return of the illness, urban populations recovered to pre-plague populations by the 16th century. Further research on abandoned rural villages and deforestation suggests that rural populations decreased over the same period and took more than a century more to return to the pre-plague population. 
But the result is counterintuitive. The general thought would be that places harder hit by the pandemic would recover more slowly, both because their population was harder hit and because people would be reticent to return to high mortality areas. Instead, the data suggests that people moved from low mortality areas in the country to high mortality areas in the city. The conclusion is that factors such as quality of land and human infrastructure, such as roads and trade routes, affected migration more than mortality rates. Mm. As the population decreased, people moved from more marginal land and land with fewer amenities to areas with better agricultural land and more amenities. The findings support the idea that Southeast England, including London, saw a significant increase in immigration from the Northern England following the pandemic. This conclusion is supported by records that have been accumulated by the Universities of York and Sheffield in England's Immigrants Database, which tracks immigration to England between 1330 and 1550. In the period following the plague, the resulting labor shortage met a demand for labor. Thus, conditions and wages were relatively good compared to many places in Europe. Supply and that demand. attracted immigrants yep. from the rest of the British Isles, Northwest Europe, and even farther afield. The research suggests that as many as one in every hundred people in medieval England was an immigrant. The result is not just a wow. mixing of English dialects, but of foreign loan words over much of the period of the Great Vowel Shift. And loan words, particularly French loan words, are another part of the explanation. The Normans brought a huge number of French words into the English language, thousands of them. Those French words and pronunciations, of course, would transform language. For example, names for animals, cow, pig, sheep, although pronounced differently in Middle English than Modern English, came from English. But the names for their meat, beef, pork, mutton, were derived from French. Courts of justice were also conducted largely in French, so many Englishmen, while still primarily speaking English, also learned French. But why would this mix of languages cause a vowel shift hundreds of years after the Norman Conquest? Well, the French used by the court developed into a unique form called Anglo-Norman. The Normans became increasingly anglicized over time. Norman nobles became increasingly likely to speak English as well as French. The loss of Normandy to Philip II of France in 1204 meant that Norman nobles started becoming more dependent upon their English holdings and divorced from the French court and customs. Increasingly, the people in power were speaking English, but with a heavy French accent, and were speaking a version of French that was highly influenced by English. <laughs> and the people who were not in power wanted to sound more like the people who were in power because it was more prestigious. The effect of French loanwords on English pronunciation was further impacted by war with the French. The series of conflicts that would be called the Hundred Years' War began in 1337. The war itself might have impacted language in a few ways, for example, causing migration based on the recruitment and movement of troops and the number of Englishmen who spent time on the continent fighting in the wars. But the war also created a resentment towards the French language as right. the language of the enemy. Hen yeah, I was kind of, I was kind of already kind of jumping ahead that that's the case. Yeah, you don't want, if you're fighting them, you don't want to talk like them. It's the same thing in World War II with the, with the German language, right? Or, or uh, World War I with the German language and uh, continuing on with World War II. You don't want people changing their names. Um, there's probably a lot of, uh, you know, the history of, you know, I mean, a good example is Windsor, right? Uh, changed from a German name. Uh, to make it sound less German, it, it's uh, it's <laughs> this part makes sense. Everything up to this part was pretty confusing, uh, in, in certain ways. I get it with uh, with the plague, people moving uh, from areas you know to different areas at first to be away from the plague, then to be able to. Essentially, what it comes down to to make more money, hence why you you would move down towards London, even though it was one of the hardest hit places with the plague. Um, but there, that's where the, all the commerce and trade is. That's you know where the wealth is. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so that I can, that I understand. So mm, interesting. This is very, it is interesting. I had a had a feeling it was going to be, but the first half of the video, I was just like, ugh. So, so wild. It created a resentment towards the French language as the language of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Henry IV, who deposed his nephew Richard II in 1399, was the first English king for whom English was his mother tongue, and he took his oath in English. This new aversion to French, even as the conversion of French-speaking nobles to English-speaking increased the use of loanwords, may have caused an overcorrection. 
when the pronunciation of French-derived words was changed to sound less French. This overcorrection might explain why a language so influenced by Romance languages ended up being pronounced so differently from them. But this doesn't really explain why the change was so massive. Well, some linguists think that that might be explained by something called a chain shift. Roughly speaking, that means that a small change might cause a change somewhere else. For example, pronouncing a vowel one way differently might require then that another vowel be pronounced differently so that the two don't sound too much alike. Phonological systems tend to naturally seek economy and symmetry, and while it's not as mechanistic as it sounds, what it means is that a small shift might have driven a chain of shifts that led to something large, like the Great Vowel Shift. One result of the Great Vowel Shift is that it partially explains why English is so, well, difficult. Spreading more or less haphazardly over time in geography, the Great right. Vowel Shift did not apply uniformly to all relevant words. For example, the letter combination spelled E-A was pronounced E eh in Middle English. Meat was met. It went through a phase where it was pronounced A. E. Meat would have been mate. And then finally the long E sound it has today, meat, along with words like speak and beam. But some words got stuck along the way. Met became meat, but steak, which would originally have been pronounced steak, got stuck in the middle at steak with words like great didn't move along to become steak. And a few other words took another shift to a diphthong or combined vowel sound to make words like bear and swear. In Middle English, those words would have all rhymed. But in Modern English, that same vowel combination is pronounced three different ways. <laughs> it was roughly over the same period that printing in England was standardizing spelling in English. Some of the new standardized spellings miss the effects of the GVS, and thus many words in English are not written as they sound. In Chaucer's time, the E at the end of words would have been pronounced, as would all consonants. Many of those sounds had become silent in spoken language, but the letters were still retained in printing. In other cases, word spelling was changed, and that obscured the relationship between them and the European languages from which they were derived. There's more confusion, as there are still many artifacts of Middle English. For example, the word shire. Every Briton will tell you that Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, and Bedfordshire are pronounced Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, and Bedfordshire. The reason is not laziness or dialect, it's that the pronunciation of those names was set before the Great Vowel Shift, when Shire would have been pronounced Sheer. Those names are literally artifacts of England's past. Oh, wow. And speaking of England's past, William the Conqueror's Doomsday Book, from which we have learned so much about England's past, is pronounced Doomsday, but spelled Domesday, D-O-M-E-S-D-A-Y. Not because the Normans couldn't spell, but because Dome was pronounced Doom before the Great Vowel Shift. And so the Norman huh. king, who spoke French, left us an artifact of Middle English. One of the most interesting things about the Great Vowel Shift is that it didn't occur elsewhere on the continent. I mean, all languages are subject to some amount of vowel shift, but the French language, for example, hardly changed over the same period, even though the French faced the same plague and the same war. The Great Vowel Shift is an artifact of the uniqueness of English history, of Norman lords who spoke a bastardized form of French and of a language of a population that was considered so low class that it went unregulated only to rise again and have to find its own path. It's of a language that is permeated by foreign words whose foreign pronunciations at some points were considered desirable and at other points considered anathema as the nation found its identity. It represents a period where England went from a backwater vassal of the French to a great nation in its own right, of a period when the people moved from largely rural to much more urban. It is a language that is as complex as the history of the English people. Gotta love his passion. So here. what about tomato <laughs> and tomato? Well, Chaucer likely would have pronounced it tomato, except that tomatoes hadn't been introduced to England in Chaucer's time. Shakespeare would have recognized what a tomato was, but he likely would have pronounced it with the short A and called it a tomato. And in modern English, it was pronounced tomato for a very long time. It was nothing but an affectation of 18th century upper class Englishmen in southern England that turned chance, dance, and castle into chance, dance, and castle, and turned tomato into tomato. And like the song implies, uh. maybe that difference isn't all that important, and we don't really have to call the whole thing off. Loved it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the.
please go support his channel. It is so important that you do so. God, that was that video was so good. Um, interesting. Uh, I'm not going to retain all of it because it, he goes through it so fast. And and but yeah, history. <laughs> I, I hadn't really thought about it. Of course, you know you don't. You just say, oh well, they just people pronounced it differently, and that's just kind of how it was. But, you know, didn't put too much thought of it when I would. When I first started the channel, many, many, uh, many, many times ago, I would say Shire. I, w I got corrected. Same with like, <clears throat> uh, instead of saying Edinburgh, you know, it's Edinburgh. So it's how and why. It's just interesting. Yeah, I don't know. That that was that was a really good video, and a lot of it did make sense, especially when it comes to the French and how, the, you know, the French language was kind of the spoken language, and how that, of course, changes over time with people uh, not wanting to sound French, and you know, all of that makes sense. I get it. Uh, hopefully, you found this information informative i did this was a really good video um let me know what you think and or is it fink <laughs> um and uh gosh I, I hope everybody's happy healthy and safe thanks so much for coming this was a great video please go support the history guy and his channel and uh, hopefully you'll come back and uh, hang out with me again all right take care bye Mark from the States, Mark from the States, it's Mark, and he's from...